safe streets, vibrant neighborhoods, successful business and commerce. These are things that make a healthy community. We are a diverse community, rural, suburban, urban, a multitude of languages and ethnicities, ages and experiences. We are a collaborative community. Public-private partnerships make us a model community that others want to follow. It is what makes us unique. It is what makes us strong. The employees of Kent County reflect our diversity and seek to serve our communities. People in this county, in this area, we wrap our arms around each other. We come together to collaborate, to solve problems. Um, we're all working for the good of the whole. And I think that's wonderful. And you can see it. You can see it as you drive around Kent County. Our impact starts the day a baby is born and a birth certificate is issued, to protecting children from deadly diseases through vaccination, to the public safety and justice provided by law enforcement and the courts, to offering veterans services and caring for the elderly. Every day we work to keep our communities robust. I think if you are somebody who is interested in serving your community, in building a strong knowledge base and a good group of people to work with, then the county is one of your best employment opportunities out there. It's been completely rewarding in every way I could possibly explain for 26 years and I feel like I grow every single day still today. Leading these dedicated employees are 19 member Board of Commissioners and our County Administrator Controller, along with our elected officials and appointed department directors, placing emphasis on civic involvement, quality housing, vibrant neighborhoods, and strong, solid infrastructure to allow businesses to thrive. Professional, dedicated, collaborative, and innovative. Behind the scenes, collaboration between foundations, charitable organizations, nonprofits, for-profit businesses, public sector demonstrated through the county, the city of Grand Rapids, the townships, all the cities and the villages in our area. If we don't come together, then we will not have the strength that we have today, and I only hope to build upon that. Our aim is to make our communities the best they can be. We are involved in exciting development projects, sustainable recycling programs, and creative progressive prevention programming. We partner with elected officials, impacting policy ideas that become great achievements. We seek opportunities to reach out into the community and offer our services to help our residents make Kent County thrive. Our relationship um, is solid, um, both from a staff standpoint at the county level, as well as the Board of Commissioners. And um, they understand what we do and the benefits that we can do for the community. And vice versa, we couldn't do what we do without the help of Kent County. While most of us are busy running our lives, Kent County's elected officials, administrator controller, and over 1,600 employees are serving the communities where we live our lives, so we can all have a place we are proud to call home. Kent County, it's life well run. Good morning and welcome to the Kent County Board of Commissioners meeting. Today's date is Thursday, September 27th, 2018. The time is 8.30 a.m. Uh, we are going to begin today's meeting with roll call. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Commissioners Vonk. Here. Antor. Here. Morgan. Here. Jones. Here. Vice Chair Bolter. Here. Commissioners Steck. Here. Ponstein. Here. Borges. Coleman. Mm -hmm. Here. Brevey. Here. Mast. Belton. Hennessy. Here. Talon. Here. Volkowski. Present. Womack. Here. Horndike. Here. Gags. Here. Chair Salfeld. Here. Mr. Chair, you have 16 mem members present, three absent. You have a quorum. Thank you. We move then to our invocation and pledge of allegiance, and I'll call on Commissioner Coleman. Good morning, Commissioners. I'm pleased to introduce this morning uh, Dr. Jeff Halstead who is the senior pastor of Calvary Baptist Church, uh, professor at various schools around the area, and has been my pastor for the last 15 years, Pastor Halstead. Good morning. Good morning. 
Uh, before I pray, I just want you to know that your names individually are on a sheet of paper in my office, and you are prayed for regularly. And I know I'm not alone. What you do matters. What you do is significant, and we thank you for your service. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come before you thanking you for the many blessings that you've given to us as individuals and as a community. It is the desire of this board to be good stewards of those resources that you've given. And I pray for them, Father. I pray for them on behalf of fellow citizens, that they would exercise good discernment, wise judgment in their decision making, in the decisions that they make that have significant impact on the lives of many people. I pray, Father, that they would be encouraged in the work that they do, that regardless of what is said or the manner in which it is said, they would indeed know that they have been entrusted with a public trust and a sacred trust of leading a community. We pray, Father, for the return of civil discourse so that we might be able, even in disagreement, to speak what needs to be spoken and to have, again, wisdom and discernment reign in our hearts and minds rather than hatred and anger. Father, I pray for these commissioners, not only in the decisions that they make, but I pray for the character of their decision making, that decisions are made in the right way, with the right motives, for the right purpose, for the flourishing of this community, the blessing of all those present. I pray that you would bless this meeting this day that things of significance would be done for the benefit of this community, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Coleman, and for that very good prayer. We move next to agenda item number five, which is public comment. A couple comments on that. Um, the fundamental purpose of the Open Meetings Act is to extend to the public the opportunity to observe public business and address public bodies. Um, but it does not give the general public the right to participate in the body's deliberations or to disrupt a meeting. So you're obviously aware of the past disruptions that we've had dating back to June. So staff and I have worked hard to find the, a, uh, the least restrictive arrangement to allow the public to observe as required by the Open Meetings Act, but prevent disruption of the board meeting. The general public may observe from the adjacent room 311 on a live audio video feed. Any member of the public that wishes to address the board during either public comment period may do so by filling out a card, giving the card to the, our staff in room 311 and they'll get the card to me. Speakers will be invited into the chambers one at a time. Once the, uh, in the chambers, the individuals will have the standard three minutes to address the board during the initial public comment and the standard one minute in the second public comment period. Following their time at the podium, the individual will be, will be asked to return to room 311 if they desire to continue to observe the board meeting, or they may choose to leave and go about their business. Members of the media, the county staff are, are both present in the chambers. As always, this meeting will be broadcast on GRTV, streamed live by the county on Facebook and YouTube and the video will be available and archived on the county website. <laughs> Just a couple reminders on public comment. Uh, speakers are uh, again asked to state their name and address and it has been our practice in the past years. Comments will be limited to three minutes per speaker. 
Speakers will be notified at the two-minute mark that they will have one minute to complete their comment and will be told when three minutes have been reached. A person may address the board on matters that are relevant to county government and the chair may disallow public comment that is unduly repetitious, not relevant to county government, or regarding matters not under consideration by the board. So with that, we'll begin public comment. As I outlined per the process earlier. And we will wait for the first one to come forward. Good morning. Would you please state your name and address? Name's August True, 2958. Reads like Boulevard. Thank you for making me feel like a criminal. Feels like a police state. This is great that we have the officers protecting us, but closing this meeting off, I just can't believe. Matthew, is there any other uh, people waiting? Then we will move to the consent agenda, and I'll call on Commissioner Coleman for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the consent agenda, which includes the uh, translation minutes. Uh, Is there support? Support by Commissioner Vaughn? Chair. Uh, Com Commissioner Jones? I yes. would like to remove a one, please. We will remove a one. Any other questions or comments on the consent agenda? I do not see any. This is a roll call vote, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On the motion to adopt the consent agenda, removing item A1. Commissioners Vonk. Yes. Antor. Yes. Morgan. Yes. Jones. Yes. Vice Chair Bolter. Yes. Commissioner Steck. Yes. Stein. Yes. Voorhees. Coleman. Yes. Breeby. Yes. Mast. Melton. Hennessy. Talon. Yes. Bulkowski. Yes. Womack. Yes. Korndike. Yes. Skaggs. Yes. Chair Salfeld. Yes. Mr. Chair, you have 16 yeas, zero nays. The motion passes. The consent agenda is adopted. Okay. I, I will um, now go to the uh, item we removed. Commissioner Jones. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to make a motion to amend the minutes to include the summary of the translation. To I think it's to approve the minutes. To approve the, the minutes with... The, with the summary of the translation included. Okay, thank you. And just so you know, what was handed out earlier was two, two pieces of paper. This relates to our last meeting as to what was said in Spanish. There is a, a longer document, which is the full translation that was uh, done, and then a summary, which is what's actually in the minutes, which is uh, the shorter one. Are there questions or, or, I'm sorry, first of all, is there a second? Support by Commissioner Ponstein. Are there questions or comments on this? Commissioner Stack. Yes. One of the things that we had talked about last time was uh, just who would be asked to do the translating when this circumstance arose. And um, by the recitation that there is a county employee who provided that, is that now going to be the official way in which we do this? This is an officially requested translation. This translation was done by a county employee that is uh, fluent and, and bilingual and does translations as part of their regular course of business. When it comes to officially figuring out a translation policy, whether it be contemporaneous or otherwise, that's more of a policy decision that the board needs to consider 
and we're, the staff is working on potential costs. We're looking at what the courthouse does for contemporaneous translations as well as the health department. And that, that type of detail will be coming back to you in a policy recommendation once it's fully vetted. In the interim, we're using a, a county employee that handles translation as part of their normal work process. Okay, but it, again, it's an individual that we requested as a board do the translating for Correct. us. Correct. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Other questions or comments? Chair. <clears throat> Commissioner Talon. I uh, gave you, I gave my colleagues um, a translation at our last meeting, and I'd like my colleagues to know that the, trans, the full translation that was given to us by a county employee is not complete. It does not include comments uh, that followed the, um, the English translation that, that also followed her remarks. There were several things that she said about her community and herself that are not part of that translation. I included them in the, um, in the uh, motion that I made. Um, I'm disappointed that they weren't in there. I'm disappointed that we didn't go outside of our county staff to do that translation, and uh, I'll be voting against this. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? I do not see any. I believe this is a roll call vote. Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On the motion to adopt the August 23, reg 20, 2018 regular meeting minutes, with the su including the summary of the translation, Commissioners Vonk. Yes. Antor. Yes. Morgan. Yes. Jones. Yes. Vice Chair Walter. Yes. Commissioner Steck. Yes. Einstein. Yes. Voorhees. Coleman. Yes. Reevee. Yes. Mast. Melton. Hennessy. Yes. Talon. Yeah, no. Olkowski. No. Womack. No. Corndike. Yes. Skaggs. Yes. <coughs> Chair Salfeld. Yes. Mr. Chair, you have 13 yeas, 3 nays. The motion passes. The minutes to the August 23rd, 2018 regular meeting with a summary of the translation in public comment are adopted. Very good. We move then to agenda item uh, number seven, which is our resolutions, and we have six of those today. For the first one, I will call on Commissioner Breeby. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to move uh, resolution 79 of today's date, the indigent defense appropriation from the administrative office. Support, Support by Commissioner Coleman. Are there questions or comments on this? I am not seeing any. This is a roll call vote. Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On the motion to adopt resolution 927 1879, Commissioners Vonk. Yes. Antor. Yes. Morgan. Yes. Jones. Yes. Vice Chair Bolter. Yes. Commissioner Steck. Yes. Ponstein. Yes. Voorhees. Coleman. Yes. Reeby. Yes. Mast. Melton. Hennessy. Yes. Talon. Yes. Polkowski. Yes. Womack. Yes. Corndike. Yes. Skaggs. Yes. Chair Salfeld. Yes. Mr. Chair, you have 16 yeas, zero nays. The motion passes. Resolution 927-1879 is adopted. Thank you. And for our second resolution, I will again call on Commissioner Brady. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to move uh, Resolution 80 of today's date, the Mental Health Court Implementation Grant from the Circuit Court. Support. And support by Commissioner Jones. Questions or comments on this resolution? I am not seeing any. This is also a roll call vote, so I will call on Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On the motion to adopt Resolution 927-1880, Commissioners Bonk. Yes. Antor. Yes. Morgan. Yes. Jones. Yes. Vice Chair Bolter. Yes. Commissioner Steck. Yes. Ponstein. Yes. Borghi. Coleman. Yes. Breeby. Yes. Mast. Melton. Hennessy. Yes. Talon. Yes. Polkowski. Yes. Womack. Yes. Corndike. Yes. Skaggs. Yes. Chair Salfeld. Yes. Mr. Chair, you have 16 yeas, zero nays. The motion passes. Resolution 927-1880 is adopted. Thank you. For the third resolution, I will call on Commissioner Voorhees, who is not here, so I will call on... <laughs> Vice Chair Bolter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move 927-1881 of today's er, resolution 81. Second. 
And it's seconded by Commissioner Skaggs. Questions or comments on this resolution? I'm not seeing any. And it is a roll call vote, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On the motion to adopt resolution 927-1881, Commissioners Vonk? Yes. Antor? Yes. Morgan? Yes. Jones? Yes. Vice Chair Bolter? Yes. Commissioner Steck? Yes. Ponstein? Yes. Voorhees? Coleman? Yes. Breeby? Yes. Mast? Melton? Hennessy? Yes. Talon? Yes. Bolkowski? Yes. Womack? Yes. Corndike? Yes. Skaggs? Yes. Chair Salfeld? Yes. Mr. Chair, you have 16 yeas, zero nays. The motion passes. Resolution 927-1881 is adopted. Thank you. For our fourth resolution, I will call on Commissioner Corndike. Thank you, Chair. I would like to move resolution 82 of today's date, the creation of one full-time sanitarian position from the health department. Support. Support by Commissioner Jones. Questions or comments on this resolution? I'm not seeing any. This is not a roll call vote, so all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. We move to our fifth resolution, and I will call on Commissioner Breeby. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to move resolution 83 of today's date, the health fund budget appropriation for 2018-19 from the health department. Support. Support by Commissioner Korndike. Questions or comments on this resolution? Uh, Commissioner Bukowski. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I just had a couple quick questions for Adam, or maybe one quick question, um, and I apologize for not asking it last week at um, finance um, when we approved this. The, um, the main question is, you know, we did a lot of work under uh, Commissioner Brevi's leadership on the lead task force. You know, we just approved <coughs> one position. You know, I mean, that's a position, not necessarily the actual remediation and such. And... Um, I guess the rhetorical question is, or maybe it's a real question. First, um, you know, we continue to have zip codes and census tracts that that have worse lead poisoning rates than the city of Flint. Um, I don't know if we have a date certain yet when we've said we, we're, we're trying to be in second place or third or, or even better than that, since we actually know these houses and we know how to fix them to prevent the poisoning that continues. So. With all of that, I mean, how much additional resources are in this budget to address the lead issue, which, again, is 100 percent preventable? Are, are we really adding those resources that the committee said we need to? Uh, so a, a number of thoughts on that. Um, there are additional resources in this budget. Uh, a couple of things I would point to in particular. The creation of the epidemiologist that was done a few months back was a one of the outcomes from the lead task force work. So that position is in here. And, and that position, while she has had her hands full with PFAS and vapor intrusion recently, we do expect that work also be focused on lead and identifying what are the, the, the precursors or what are the factors that, uh, that we can work on. The expense of remediation uh, countywide is extraordinary and beyond the resources of any entity to solve individually. So what things can we do as a community? We charged, you charged, uh, upon receiving the lead task force report, the Community Health Advisory Committee with the job of looking at those recommendations and building a strategic plan and some actual actions that we can put in place now. Uh, that committee is going to receive that report today. Uh, I understand there's going to be a number of, of things in, included in that, which will have some price tags associated with them. We have a financial uh, component to this that we are talking about how do we work with the community to raise some of these, these, these uh, resources. Uh, and we'll have a conversation here, I'm sure, with how do we uh, do match some of those uh, some of those opportunities as well. Some other things we've done, and one of the things that is you just accomplished a few moments ago with creating a sanitarium position. That wasn't uh, on, on the books until this point. Uh, we have had an arrangement with the city of Grand Rapids for a while now. They have resources through HUD to do remediation. This sanitarium position is going to be critical to identifying what are the highest risk properties not just the properties where we've seen kids with the highest rates of blood in their lead, but what are properties 
where we've seen uh, other risk factors besides the biomonitoring, um, the age of the property, the location of the property, and getting proactive with looking at those properties uh, before a child is poisoned so that we can recommend them uh, to this grant the city has for remediation. Uh, we're also working with, uh, and working with the School of Public Health at the University of Michigan on developing some outreach materials for landscaping. One of the things we heard during the flood task force uh, testimonies was that uh, landscaping and grass and what we're planning around our home and how we're treating uh, dirt being tracked into the house by, by children and others is important. So how do we in increase the outreach there? They're helping us with some of these materials. We do have some additional resource in this budget for, uh, for outreach. Uh, education is a critical component that we do have within our circle of control somewhat to, uh, to really get the message out there on prevention and what are some practical things that families can do to reduce their risk. So it's not a solution. Not right now. We're working on it. We've got some pieces in this budget, but we're also looking forward to the recommendations today at CHAC. Quick follow-up, is, is there an estimated number that if, if yeah, I mean, how, what would it cost? You said it's a huge amount. What, what is that number? Even a ballpark? Yeah, so as I recall from the report, there are, I think we had 87,000 homes that are at risk for, for uh, having it led because of the age of the home and the location of the homes. And at an average cost or remediation of, I think we had $25,000 per home. Um, I don't have a calculator in front of me, but if you multiply those two, it's an extraordinarily enormous number. Uh, we probably can't spend our way to a solution right now on this. We're going to have to work to identifying where the hottest risk areas are, what are the most challenging situations, how do we work with landlords and others. Uh, to, uh, to do at least what it, they can do with, with spot uh, solutions and, and looking at windows and doors and some of the higher risk um, uh, places in the home. How do we continue to educate contractors so that when they're remodeling or when they're scraping paint, they're following what the rules they're supposed to be following, make sure that enforcement's happening. Uh, but to, to put a dollar and to ask this board or any other uh, any other entity for uh, for that amount, it's it's not practical right now. Last, um, is, do we estimate the lifetime cost of, of the impact on a person of lead poisoning in the sense of, okay, it's 27000 to remediate it if a five-year-old has lead poisoning for a couple of years. <laughs> what What's the negative impact cost to the person, the family, the system of that lead poisoning? Is there a cost I don't, on that? Sorry, I, I don't have that, that number, um, okay. but, uh, but certainly we know that lead is, uh, is a tragic thing and that being exposed to it has serious lifelong health effects, sure. All right, thanks, Adam. Just sure. to clarify, I'm not sure you stated the number right. You said 25000 27. Uh, Twenty-five thousand dollars per home for, yeah. for the full for eighty-seven thousand. Eighty-seven thousand homes. 87, okay. homes All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Commissioner Antor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to say on this lead issue, we we do have obviously problems that we have to try to overcome, but it's going to take a long time. We're discovering things every day of where we can get lead, you know, into our bodies from. <clears throat> and I was reminded by a, a gentleman he was working he to testify over in Flint regarding their the lead levels over there. He's an engineer, and he, he said to me, he said, you, do you know that, he asked me what my age was, just growing up here in the Grand Rapids area back in the 60s, you have more lead in your system because of the leaded gasolines we used back there than probably most of the people in Flint have by drinking the water. And I was shocked by that. Um, and he said, that, that's a fact. And he said, I, I fall in that same age group. And I, it got me thinking, what else is out there? that you know, we don't know about or we didn't know about then. So it's a really complex issue, and the answers aren't going to come overnight. So I understand where you're coming from. Any other questions or comments? I do not see any. Thank you, Adam. Uh, this is a roll call vote. Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On the motion to adopt Resolution 927-1883, Commissioners Bonk? Yes. Antor? Yes. Morgan? Yes. Jones? Yes. Vice Chair Bolter? Yes. Commissioner Stuck? Yes. Ponstein? Yes. Voorhees? 
Coleman. Yes. Breeby. Yes. Mast. Melton. Hennessy. Yes. Talon. Yes. Volkowski. Yes. Womack. Yes. Corndike. Yes. Skaggs. Yes. Chair Salfeld. Yes. Mr. Chair, you have 16 yeas, zero nays. The motion passes. Resolution 927-1883 is adopted. Thank you for our final resolution this morning. I will call on Commissioner Bonk. Thank you, Chair. I will resolution 84 of today's date. Request to incorporate additional positions beginning October 1. Friend of the court, juvenile detention, Ken County Community Action. Sure. Support. Commissioner Jones supported. Are there questions or comments on this resolution? I do not see any. Oh, we got one there. Commissioner Skaggs. <laughs> Just got in on another wire. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> um, for the, uh, the Kent Community Action um, conversion from part-time to full-time, it says that's covered by the Community Service Block Grant and Housing Choice Vouchers Funds. Yes. I wondered if we can get a little explanation on that. Get up, Matthew. Come up. Good morning. Um, we have available federal grant funds through those two programs um, that we're uh, reallocating to this uh, position. And so that's what we're asking for. Um, and we um, canceled um, or eliminated a few different um, uh, part-time positions to be able to get this done um, in the budget. Um, so we're not taking funds away from housing vouchers? No, not at all. This is administrative fees. Okay. Any other questions? I do not see any. Thank you, Matthew. This is a roll call vote, so I'll call on Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> on the motion to adopt resolution 927-1884, Commissioners Vonk? Yes. Antor? Yes. Morgan? Yes. Jones? Yes. Vice Chair Bolter? Yes. Commissioner Steck? Yes. Ponstein? Yes. Voorhees? Coleman? Yes. Breeby? Yes. Mast? Melton? Commissioners Hennessy? Yes. Talon, yes. Bolkowski, yes. Womack, yes. Korndike, yes. Skaggs, yes. Chair Salfeld. Yes. Mr. Chair, you have 16 yeas, zero nays. The motion passes. Resolution 927-1884 is adopted. Thank you. We'll move then to public comment. Is there any other public comment? I do not see that there is anyone else waiting, so we will move to agenda item number nine, which are reports. Um, I will start off um, with one. We have a board chair appointment I'm going to report on due to the recent vacancy on the local development finance authority, or I think what's otherwise known as the smart zone. Uh, I'm appointing Wayman Britt to fill the unexpired three-year term of Mary Swanson. That's ending December 31st, 2019. Uh, this is a position that traditionally, or I believe always, has been filled by a uh, staff person, I think Daryl DeLavio used to fill it Bob as well, White. Bob White, yeah. in the past. So um, I just am giving notice of that. Any questions on, on that? I don't see any, so let's move. Any other reports that anybody has this morning? No reports. Okay, let's move to Commissioner Miscellaneous. Any Commissioner Miscellaneous this morning? Commissioner Morgan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I had the opportunity to attend the Freedom Cruise uh, that uh, Commissioner um, Antor and Commissioner over here, Vaughn. Uh, <laughs> over here, they call over it. Over here, yeah. Uh, are involved in. I have to tell you, it was a very, very moving experience. Uh, the crowd was unbelievable. There was over a thousand vehicles in the in the cruise and I just uh, want to extend an invitation to my colleagues if you ever have the opportunity to attend this Freedom Cruise and kind of thank our veterans and pay tribute to the fallen heroes it, it's a great thing I don't want to take this away from Tom but uh, you know I just wanted to report on it Tom you can follow up or, or Ted if you want to but uh, Ted gave a very moving invocation and it was just a great event so if you get the opportunity next year please come out and see this I would concur in that I was at it last year and, and, and I know Tom, Commissioner Antwer has done tremendous amounts of work over the years to make that a good event as well. So, Any other uh, miscellaneous this morning? Commissioner Breevy. Thank you, Chair. I um, just wanted to invite everyone to the check meeting this afternoon. It's at 12 o'clock at the Health Department and we will be talking about the subcommittee's report on lead and some of the um, suggestions they have. Okay. 
Uh, Commissioner Steck. Thank you, Chair. Just a couple of items. Uh, we had heard from the uh, federal uh, employee before on the status of uh, opioid financing and funding, and as I recall, there was some discussion about availability of additional grant funds. I'm just wondering if there's any update on that process. Uh, are we pursuing additional grants, or have we fully exhausted that? That's simply one question I have. This is related to which grants are you? The, the opioid funding. We are um, anticipating, yes, there will be additional dollars, and we will pursue them. Okay. We haven't identified specific dollars, but we expect that there will be. So. Great. We're not leaving anything on the table. No. Good. So the second comment I guess I have is uh, would uh, encourage us to identify that policy on translating uh, when presentations come to this board in a different language, whether it's Spanish or anything else. So we have a good policy. We don't need this dividing this board. So uh, I look forward to a prompt response on that. Any other? Uh, okay, Commissioner Bukowski. Yeah, um, I just want to, uh, I, I guess, pick up my, my request way back in June when we were first visited by the folks um, who are we're demanding the end of the sheriff's contract with ICE and, and my request for us as a committee to have some kind of task force to really look at what's happening. Um, and in spite of folks not being here today, in spite of us keep pushing public comment into where we've never gone before. Um, and, and again, I understand, you know, what is their or not their right to disrupt us and our our right to do our business, all those parts and pieces. However, at the same time, usually, you know, I, whatever little bit I've been trying over the past few months to, to instigate this, this public conversation, one of the main forces of headwind is the sheriff is a separate elected official and the sheriff has his own authority. Well, at the same time, so is the treasurer. You know, the treasurer gets elected and, and there is probably no single issue that we've spent more time and energy critiquing as a collective than the land bank. The land bank gets zero general fund dollars by our decision. However, you know, I mean, again, when the land bank was last in here a couple months ago, it was extremely scrutinized on what it's doing or not doing under the purview of the separately elected treasurer who has some level of authority to do what now it's a he, um, chooses to do within that authority. So again, how can we look at what the sheriff's doing in this instance? Especially because as, as it relates to the folks that are critiquing the contract, they like to, it's a, is it a falsehood? At least it's misleading that the sheriff made $18,000 on holding people. The sheriff did not make 18000 He got paid 18000 you know? Because, of course, at least I think I've learned that it costs more than $85 a day. So, so therefore, somehow we are spending general fund dollars to house these folks, or we're spending millage dollars. We're spending some county resources to house these folks since it isn't a full break even. So we, we should be looking at this issue. And, because, and again, in spite of the fact, because I say it, when I have the opportunity to speak with my friends who come and disrupt us, because many of them are friends, um, that, hey, it's a federal issue. Let's go talk to the feds. I understand that. At the same time, how can we really look at how families are being disrupted here and taken advantage of? Employers of every political stripe, I believe, have employed, not, not every employer, make sure you're not hearing me say this, but employers of every political stripe have hired illegal folks and probably know they're illegal, so they, how are they taking advantage of that? How are these folks impacting our economy to the good? We've got to really do something about it in spite of the fact that folks aren't here today um, demanding those things. Again, as a county commission, what best way to help the situation in under our control? I believe, again, that the sheriff wants to be part of those dialogues. There are some things the sheriff can be doing. Um, short of ending the contract. So again, full and honest public task force or whatever we call it, short of uh, who knows what. So we got to get there because um, it's not going to go away no matter how much we, we try to keep insulated our act or our activities. And, and yeah, so 
please, Chair, I, I hope we can do that with staff's support, with the sheriff's support, and really see where we can go on this. Thank you. I just want a clarification. Do what? Have do I mean have? We did a task force on the front of the court yes. advisory committee. And there is a group that is meet. This is since it's under the sheriff's purview. There is a group that the sheriff I know is meeting with to look at this. I'm not sure it would be appropriate for for the commission to impanel a group to oversee what the sheriff's policies are. You see what I'm saying? Well, at the same time, you know, we're going to decide. We just, you know, approved a few positions for the sheriff today. There will be general fund resources that we will approve to go to the sheriff's department. Um, there, and, and just as much as the friend of the court is, is part of the court, I mean, we have as well a relatively arm's length relationship with the court. So I'm not saying we do something by ourselves, but I would, I, again, what little conversations I've had with the sheriff and some of his staff, I think they'd be open to looking at, just like the friend of the court advisory committee, which was duly or appointed both by you and the chief judge, and, and given that charge, a similar thing could happen between you and the sheriff to give that charge to really look at what's happening and, and how best to, and yeah, and yeah, I'll, I'll okay. yeah, we'll look into that. I do think there is a group that's already looking at a lot, a lot of those things, but we'll definitely look more into that. Uh, Commissioner Antor. Thank you, Chair. Commissioner Bukowski just brought up a, a good point. I was just thinking about um, that with ICE. I, I think looking at the reports, and maybe one of the um, folks from the Sheriff's Department can help me with this, but the overwhelming um, amount of reports that were taken over by ICE or handed off to ICE were made by local departments that made local arrests. They found that these folks were undocumented, then they turned them over to ICE. So they were all arrestable offenses, uh, but as part of the processing those arrests, they found out they were not documented, so then they turned turn it over to ICE. So as far as I could tell, these people would have ended up in jail by the local authorities that made the arrests. ICE only gets involved because they're called because these folks are undocumented. And uh, I'm, I think I'm correct in that, but if, if somebody could clarify. Good morning. Good morning. Chuck DeWitt, Chief Deputy over Corrections, and, and Commissioner Antor, you are correct. Um, the numbers that he is referencing, again, date back to 2017. And I did a, a deep dive analysis of the 185 individuals that were detained and eventually turned over to ICE and the majority were in fact arrested locally by local law enforcement for a criminal charge to then have a detainer placed once those fingerprints were submitted to the feds and identified as a, a potential want by ICE. Okay. All right. So they were going to be lodged. You. They were going to be lodged anyhow. This is just one extra step, which you're going to get an extra step when you're dealing with uh, you know, the federal government. And then two, um, I also wanted to thank Ted Bonk for an incredible invocation. Ted, that was, that's why we picked you. Um, your heart and your soul was into that, and, and a lot of people really appreciated that. And uh, I just want to say our, this, the family this year was the family of Nicholas Rausch um, from Middlefield, Michigan, that we honored. We'll be honoring another West Michigan soldier last year. But uh, I just wanted to thank everybody who turned out, and I got to ride with Roger Morgan in his ambulance, which was pretty cool. But uh, anyhow, we'll keep everybody posted for next year. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Talon. Thank you, Chair. I want to say that I am deeply, deeply disturbed by the process that you chose to put into place this morning to control public access to our public meeting. I've been involved in local government for decades, and I have never seen anything that comes close to our your limitation, this was not a choice of this board, limitation of public access to this meeting. For the record, I don't support it, I don't understand why, and I hope we don't continue it. Thank you. Commissioner Pondstein. Thank you, Chair Salfeld. Got a call the other day, and you know I've been speaking about the zoo and their breeding programs, and it seems like it's at a it's going to stumble here. 
uh, the person the committee has been assigned to in the Senate has said that he's not going to move it out to a vote, so the senators won't even have a vote on it. There is a remote, a remote chance that it may be brought up in lame duck, but right now it just doesn't look good. The uh, Detroit Zoo is a very big lobbyist against granting that right to Grand Rapids, and it's uh, also hearing that the governor is a big fan of the Detroit Zoo, too. So uh, keep your efforts up. Uh, it's definitely not the end, but it's not looking good. And this is just a, another example of East versus West. It's wrong, and uh, it's penalizing West Michigan. And I just hope people realize that, and you can stress that not only to your own senators and legislators, but other people uh, within there. Uh, you know, to name the person that could probably get it passed would be the Senate leader, Arlen Meekoff. And he's been known just to let the committee chairs do what they want, and he just stands on the sidelines. So I just thought I'd give you a brief update on that, but it doesn't look good. Okay. Commissioner Womack. Yes, I would like to uh, add on to what uh, Mr. Bukowski said, that um, we have talked to the land bank and other departments, um, even those as the land banks that are not under our jurisdiction, to really tell the land bank what to do. After we voted that it could exist, we could only vote that it not continue to exist. So there's a checks and balance that our forefathers wanted with all forms of government. So even with our sheriff being elected, we have been voted in not only to be the voice for our community, but to take a look at our health department, what they're doing, our sheriff department, all of the facilities that receive public funds. So I don't think we can just easily dismiss um, any talk about the ICE contract under the sheriff being an elected official. I would like to take up for the sheriff on one comment, though, um, that that was probably just missaid that the sheriff is paid um, just so that I know exactly what Mr. Bukowski meant, but just so that the public understands that there's fixed costs associated with housing those who have been accused of a crime. So that is what those payments are going for when they're held those extra days. So it's nothing that the sheriff is benefiting from financially. When we talk about the crimes that they've been charged with, we have to remember they have been accused of these crimes and minorities are arrested at a higher level than the majority of Americans <laughs> in America. Poor people, whether white, black, or Hispanic, are arrested more. <clears throat> Who don't have the access to the legal aid they need in America. So the fact that they've been arrested and accused of a crime is, is not a reason for us to look at them any less than or look at the rights that um, our Hispanic community is talking about when it comes to this ICE contract. But it, so, one of the reasons it's very hard for me to speak about this is because it's been so much deranged behavior. It's very deranged for anybody to go to the chairman's house and protest because he is a part of our board. There's no decision made by this board that you can put upon one person. So I definitely would ask protesters to stop making Jim Softfield like uh, public enemy number one. He's simply doing his job. It's also deranged behavior to come to a meeting and hold a meeting while elected officials who represent people amongst ourselves. When you think of all the voters, Easily, we represent hundreds of thousands of people here. It's not just us. It's the people that we represent. Today, we had to vote on the grant for mental health court, which is helping stop a lot of people with mental disabilities from ending up in jail when they should be getting help. So we have important work to do. So that's deranged behavior to um, have leadership try to hold a meeting within our meeting. But now we are venturing upon deranged behavior. The public also has a right to be able to be in this room. But if you look at today's event without looking what led us here, um, 
you would really look at our chair and some of those that made that decision and say, well, why did they make that decision? This was the first meeting we've been able to get through in months. So that's why that behavior came, but we can't continue to meet deranged behavior with deranged behavior. Um, and even though I mentioned some of the things that the protesters did that I don't agree with, I do agree with their voice needs to be heard that the issue of ICE nationally um, separating babies from their mothers, uh, the fear when you are in the Hispanic community, as I have a lot of friends and business owners in the Hispanic community that do um, sponsorships with my radio station and when I'm there visiting and I overhear people in the community when they talk about ICE coming, it's almost like you think a raid upon the whole community is coming. When they talk about uh, some of our federal agencies, Kalamazoo has opted out of this contract. I don't believe Ottawa has a contract with them. Um, we're one of the few major counties of this population that have a contract with ICE. And when we study Kalamazoo opting out of the ICE contract, it also lets, and I shouldn't just say our Hispanic community because they have a lot of white people that are marching with them. They have African Americans that are marching with them. People within our community that are concerned with the ICE contract also see in Kalamazoo how that contract was ended by the sheriff after a resolution by the Kalamazoo County Commissioners. So I truly believe that whether it's brought to a vote and they just get us on record to find out where we stand on the ICE contract because I'm against it, but I also understand those of my colleagues who are for the ICE contract. There's a lot of great reasons for them to be for the ICE contract. Number one, um, when it comes to the finances falling upon the county, that would be a reasonable reason for anyone to say, hey, we don't want to pay that if the federal government's going to pay it, so we can't call them racist and, um, and um, call them racist because they don't want the county to pay for that. Um, I'm against the contract, but um, I hope we can have some conversations with the leadership of the protesters to find out where this ends, and I will end this. I thank you, uh, Chair, and my colleagues for letting me uh, carry on. I usually don't want to talk this long, but it's either me or Pornstein, so you were short today. I had to make up for it. Um, but I, I would hope that we can have a session to talk about how we do deal with protesters because the decision that was made by a few all of us have to carry burden with it as commissioners, even though we didn't have a voice in it, and we do need to do something, but this might be too far, and we have to find somewhere in the middle that is representative of the rights of the people and what is expected of us in Kent County. So I would hope that even though we're looking at um, having more meetings with the protests, it's been asked that we have task force made, um, whether we do that or not, I would hope that we as commissioners can get together and talk about how we can all have some input and a voice on how we handle our meetings <clears throat> because uh, a lot of our voters may not agree with what happened today. Um, but I did want to put what happened today in context. Thank you. Commissioner Hennessy. I appreciate the comments of uh, Commissioner Womack. Um, I, I, in his, his, one of his final sentiments that, you know, that we would be helpful to have a session even between ourselves um, on, on how to deal with um, dissent of, among in, in protesters. And, and, you know, and it, and it is true, we carry the burden of the decisions we make. I, we have, you know, we do have, as he just said, important work to do. And there's it's certainly evidenced by the agendas. And the, and the work that we've been doing over the past um, meeting weeks. And um, it also is true that there's a public right to participate and that there be transparency in how we do our work. And, you know, I really do appreciate that we, you know, that you've tried to be creative in allowing this, but perhaps we could have more discussion um, just even among ourselves on how we do this, how we achieve this, how we get our work done, but how we also, you know, keep our meetings open to the public 
and you know something sometimes not all the good things are compatible but I think that you know we there should be a little bit more openness and discussion among ourselves as we move forward okay thank you Commissioner Coleman thank you mr. chair um, if it is appropriate to from a legal and whatever other perspectives to get a list of like the most recent 75 or 100 like detainers and what the charge was like I would be interested to see that just to consider that kind of factual uh, aspect of this matter um, and then additionally a comment I, I think we should uh, I at least think back to a year or so ago and just remember the uh, the heated uh, discussions and debate around the front of the court um, and the deputies there and that whole process and just thinking back and to, to commend all of those folks who participated in that and the subcommittee that followed uh, that I think was an example of how to you know how to protest and how to work you know within the dem democratic process to really uh, achieve a, a good end for everyone and I, I commend those folks and would encourage any other members of the public who have issues on their minds and hearts to uh, look to that as a model of how to participate. All right, any other, uh, Commissioner Bonk? Yes, thank you, Chair. We have a wonderful event taking place in Grand Rapids now called Art Prize, and almost measuring up to Art Prize is the new collage at the Recycling Center. We had a ribbon cutting <laughs> last week. And from the moment you open the door and go upstairs, there's views from the South Kent landfill, and. Uh, Many photographs and uh, displays of recycling up there, and uh, Darbas says it's the finest uh, collage in the country of, of that kind of work. And so I'd like to thank the staff over there for all their good work. Uh, going back in history a little bit that uh, Roger remembers, uh, the first garbage disposal in town was on an island in the Grand River, and they had pigs uh, taking care of that garbage uh, back in those days. And then, easy, easy now. <laughs> And then uh, Dan's always talking about the airport and how well they're doing, but at the turn of the century, Grand Rapids was the uh, 44th largest city in the United States, which would put us, put us in about the place of uh, Miami or St. Paul, Minnesota. So, uh, Dan, you've got to get them flights up a little more to get to build this up and catch us up with uh, what was taking place at the turn of the century. So, anyway, some good stuff that's happened at the DPW. Good. Commissioner Morgan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I know for a fact that uh, it's not really easy to sit in that chair and be chair of a board, especially a 19-member board. But uh, um, I want to thank the chair for the leadership. I think he's been very patient, very patient on this issue. And uh, I appreciate the fact that uh, I don't think we're violating any Open Meetings Act. And I believe that we're able to conduct our business in a way uh, and not shut out the public. But uh, I just want to commend the chair for the leadership. Uh, it's a tough thing to sit in that chair. We all need, need to keep that in mind as we move forward. Thank you. Um, any other commissioners that uh, I know, Antor, Commissioner Antor has one more comment, so go ahead. I had to take another bite. Commissioner Womack, you may not think you talk a lot, but maybe you don't, but you are provocative when you say things. And, and I just wanted to respond to one thing. Um, you know, again, if we're going to be crystal clear on this, these folks that are turned over to ICE, I'm talking about the ones that were arrested in these local municipalities, they get turned over to ICE because they're undocumented. Um, if that step didn't occur, they would go directly to, to jail. If it's a lodgeable offense, um, they're going to go right to jail. So to think that we're doing something wrong or we're ripping kids out of their parents' arms, it's the parents' responsibility to not go to jail, right? We don't, wanna, we don't want to reward bad behavior. We want to punish bad behavior. And anybody that lives in this country legally and does not does an offense that's logical, in effect, they're separating themselves from their children, okay? So... I just want to make that crystal clear. Look at the reports. I'm glad you brought it up. Let's look at all the offenses. They're real serious. The one we had in Sparta was, was a felonious assault. And um, Sparta called the ICE department because um, they were undocumented. So that's the only 
extra step. But it doesn't take away from the fact that these are very serious charges. And I, that's why I don't understand this argument at all, to be honest with you, especially after looking at the offenses. Thank you. Okay. Um, I regretted at calling on a second, but now that I did it, I need to give Commissioner Walmack. You got two minutes, same time he had. Go ahead, Commissioner Walmack. You're talking about an exemption. Community and minorities, Hispanic being the mixture of Native Indian um, by the oppressors, the European white Spaniards uh, who enslaved and raped a uh, community. If the Indians had had the same programs we had and set up a ICE, the pilgrims would have never been able to take over America. So when we look at how people are treated, and once again I said, these people are accused of crimes. They haven't been taken to court, they haven't been found guilty, and we have a contract that is giving people an incentive especially since Donald Trump got into office and publicly went on television and made them public enemy number one. Even though we still have rapists in our community of all colors, we still have murderers of all colors, we still have terrorists like the young white American who went into a Carolina church and tried to kill everybody in there. Our president in the executive office has made the Hispanic community and the immigrants public enemy number one by calling them rapists and murderers and other people have taken up that mantle. We are spending more than the $18,000 now that we are in a state where we have to have a police state right here at our board meeting. And I don't really think we have to have as many deputies here as we uh, have if we would learn to communicate with this community. So I would just ask that, um, taking nothing away from our chair's decision because his decision definitely got us through a meeting finally and I'm happy to see that. But I would say we need to understand <clears throat> we've got a lot to do when it comes to reaching out to that community, being able to conversate with them so they don't feel forced to be in a position to get our attention and the sheriff department attention by doing some of the behavior that I don't agree with over the past month. And I will look forward to uh, speaking to their leadership and I would think other commissioners would want to do that. The white privilege is when there's issues with white America, they don't have to march. When you have commissioners in your family, judges in your family, rich people in your family, and even if you're middle class and not rich, that degree of separation isn't as far as it is for African Americans and Hispanics to get to the powers that be. So if we don't understand that we have a divide separate from the ICE issue uh, with the Hispanic community, and we need to open up those lanes of conversation where they can feel comfortable, then we have a problem that's gonna continue. Okay, uh, I'll just have a final comment regarding the uh, Open Meetings Act and how we handled it this time. Um, we have had disruption since June. We have tried to work through that disruption. We have suspended meetings. We have actually moved our meetings. And there's not a lot of options left. I'm trying to balance a lot of things here. I'm, not, I'm trying to avoid arrests, okay? I don't want to see people get arrested. And uh, Commissioner Hennessy, you talked about dis dissent. Dissent is fine. It's disruption that is the problem. We need to be able to conduct our meeting. Uh, and I would like to do that and get through important business. We have timelines. We need to meet on certain important contracts and things that come through us. We need to be able to get our business done. And if we're going to have disruptions, we have got to respond to that disruption in a way that honors what the Open Meetings Act wants. What does the Open Meeting Act want? They, they want the ability for people to observe us and to be able to address us. And that is what we are providing to the people that want to come in in the process that we currently have set up. And in that process, we're avoiding arrest. We are, we are able to get through our business. We can't just move our meeting every meeting. We got some commissioners with mobility issues. How are we gonna handle that? Are we gonna leave those people behind? 
you know, we got to be able to get this done. So it is a balancing act. It is something that you have to take all sorts of things into consideration in. I give the staff a lot of credit. The, the, the latest approach on this, I think, is one that is truly the middle ground that Commissioner Womack talked about because we're able to uh, be able to have all of the public observe what's going on and there all of the public is still able to address us on any issues that are of concern to them. So I think this is a great way to resolve the disruption issue. If we get to a point where we don't have to worry about disruptions anymore, we can go back to the normal way that we've done it where people are sitting in here along with us. This, so I don't see this as, a, as hopefully a long-term uh, uh, way to do business. Uh, but at least right now, I think it's the middle ground that Commissioner Womack spoke of. So that's it. We are up to agenda item number 11, which is adjournment, and I will call on Commissioner Coleman. I move to adjourn subject to the call to chair to Thursday, October 11th at 6 p.m. for our annual meeting. Support. All in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. We are adjourned. I am Kent County. I am Kent County. I am Kent County. We are 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 Kent County. Bayard Kent County. Ami Kent County. Somos Kent County. Mas Ira Kent County. We, we are Kent County. We, we are, are Kent, Kent County. County. We are Kent County. Oh yeah.